Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here, going to start a unit in World Cultures at Philcrest High School. Uh, this unit on Latin America, and we start off with chapter 20, which looks at the geography and early history of Latin America. So we're going to move from where we're at in Central Illinois down through areas that include uh, Mexico, Central America, and moving from there even including areas in the Caribbean, uh, down into South America, and all that region is all Latin America. Very diverse. We'll find out why that leads to something called regionalism. Okay. And we're also going to find out a little bit about not just the early civilizations that lived in Latin America, but how that region of the world came to be dominated by a country in Europe, primarily Spain. So here we go. Let's take a look at Latin America, geography, and early history. Okay. One of the things we want to talk about in Latin America is this idea of climate and in terms of elevation. A lot of folks ask questions about that on your queue, so let's see if we can explain it a little bit. Okay, The lowest level of elevation in the tropics, and the thing about tropics and weather, is that the further north or south I go, or higher in latitude from the equator, further north or south, One of the things we're going to look at uh, in Latin America, and something a lot of you guys ask questions about on your URQs, is something to do with uh, this Tierra Caliente, this idea of how elevation affects climate. Okay, So we want to look at that a little bit. Um, one of the areas that's mentioned in there is this idea of being Tierra Caliente. This is the area from sea level to 2,500 feet. That's the lowest lying area, hottest temperatures. We've got tropical rainforests. Um, people come in and start growing crops like uh, bananas, sugarcane, rice, other tropical crops, some livestock. Uh, they're not so happy about the temperatures down there, but that's the way it works. Okay, Going up to the Tierra Templada, this is a little bit cooler region. Okay, We're about 2,500 to 6,000 feet, Okay, so we're dropping temperature and we'll get into that in just a second uh, with every you know 1,000 feet of elevation. But uh, this is an area with the largest human population. we got sheep, cattle, dairy going on here, corn being grown, maize. We'll talk about that a bit later and its importance in Latin America. Uh, small grains, if we get into South America, we might look into some what's called a super grain like quinoa, um, something still around today, highest protein content of any grain still around. Okay. Above the Tierra Templada is the Tierra Fria, and this is typically the three main zones they talk about when they talk about uh, zones in the tropics in Latin America. This is 6,000 to 12,000 feet, which is where the tree line is. We've gone, in this case, another 6,000 feet, a huge range. And depending on what we're going to be at, uh, you're looking at barley grazing, some potatoes, uh, more in South America. Potatoes came from the Americas over to Europe, okay, and some dairy operations. And they're kind of showing you on that chart barley, grazing, potatoes, dairy operations in terms of which can go at which elevations. And above that we have the Tierra Helada, the Punta, or the Tierra Nevada. Uh, this is where the snow line is. This is where some grazing goes on, but not where much is going on. In fact, the highest area in Central America is the Tierra Fria. Okay. And if you want to look at it more as a true kind of a mountain kind of thing, here's the same thing, a little bit different. Altitudinal zonation. Okay, I told you we talked a little bit about climate and elevation, so let's break it down and make it a little bit mathematically even something my wife would approve of, but here we go. Okay, basically what we're saying is the higher in altitude I go, the colder the temperature. Okay, and this is true in terms of higher in latitude that I go, which is further north or south of the equator. So the higher the latitude, the colder the temperature, the higher the altitude, the colder the temperature as well. Okay, so what's the effect of that? Generally speaking, a temperature drop of about four degrees for every thousand feet of elevation I gain. That means drop of four degrees in terms of average uh, daily temperature, average evening temperature, so our overall temperature. Um, and in this, if you took, for example, we're 75 degrees at the bottom of a mountain and we went to 10,000 feet, we're now it's going to be about 35 degrees. As you can see, that climbing in elevation in those various uh, areas in Latin America from Caliente to Templada uh, to Tierra Fria, that's going to really change the temperature and how we live and what we can grow and what we can raise. 
Okay, another thing I want to look at was this idea of what is a rain shadow, and this is something that's going to be on the test as well. Uh, this is a concept we see in lots of places around the world. When we get to India, we'll see that with the Himalayas. But here we're talking about Central and South America, and we're talking about the Andes Mountain, that cordillera that runs down, that backbone that runs down the backside of uh, South America there. And we have is warm, moist, tropical air coming from Brazil, from the rainforest of the Amazon, being forced up higher and higher in elevation, as we know. No, the higher in elevation it goes, the colder it gets. Colder air can hold less moisture than warm air, and as a result, it starts falling out. It condenses, falls out in the form of snow, higher or snow in higher elevations, and rain in lower elevations. And by the time it gets over to the backside of the Andes, because the wind is being pushed east to west, as opposed to west to east, like where we live, it starts coming down the mountains now. This is very dry air. In fact, it gets drier and drops in, temp in elevation. It gets warmer and warmer, and actually it starts pulling moisture out of the ground. And we get the Atacama Desert over here, one of the driest places in the world, some areas 400 years with no rain. Interesting little microclimate in some regions of that where literally coming in right off the ocean, we have this mist and stuff, and we see some grasses growing and then hits the edge of the desert and it just stops. Sort of like fog coming in from the ocean, or as far as that gets, after that, no plant life. Okay, we look at that as we saw earlier when you saw the globe at the very beginning of the video, you saw the fact that this is a vast, vast region. South America itself, about one-sixth of the world's uh, land mass and counting also parts of North America, Central America, the Caribbean, vast area. But because of the geography and because it's so spread out and so scattered, people can't get across various things to uh, interact with each other. And so they develop little regions of cultures which we refer to as regionalism. Okay. To give you an example, we got things like the mountains and the forests that are creating barriers. So we have limited contact among these people, which leads to that idea, again, as we said, of regionalism. In fact, one of those regions is a grassy plateau in Argentina and Uruguay, which is this grassy big plains, think our Great Plains region in the United States, and it's called the Pampas, okay? Regionalism, Pampas, on your study guide, write them down, pause me, get back to me in just a second. Okay, going to start off with our pre-Columbian civilizations. Pre-Columbian means pre-Columbus, Mr. Juan Cristobal Colón, that Italian Genoese, really, guy who sailed for Spain and discovered America. Uh, the civilizations we're going to look at are the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Incas. But we're going to start off with the Mayans, who here in Central America and Southern Mexico uh, were the oldest of those civilizations and very much on the topic of some students' minds with the fact that it's 2012 and supposedly the year the civilization of the world is going to end in December, but I'm not betting on it. Anyway, I'd study for your test if you got one around that time. Okay. The Mayans, they had uh, two big cities, one at Tikal and the other at Palenque. Um, vast cities like in other places in Mes Mesoamerica, like we saw with the... Um, uh, Egyptians, these guys are building pyramids as well, uh, sports centers, temples, holding sacrifices, uh, and they control a big part of that area for thousands of years. Okay, And of course you guys again know them as important for that idea of their calendar, which says it's going to end, but again, I'm not betting on it. I'm going to keep going here with our next uh, pre-Columbian civilization. I'm going to look this time at the Aztecs, okay? They are in southern and central Mexico, and their two big cities are Tenochtitlan and Teotihuacan, okay? Tenochtitlan is probably their most famous city. This is a large city built on an island in the middle of a lake, and they start building these floating terraces around it uh, in order to do gardening. And it's a great defensive position, actually a place they went to at first because they were being beat up by their neighbors. Pretty soon, they start beating up on all their neighbors and take them over. Okay, This then would be that central area that we saw was the island, and then they've added these areas here. When the Spanish get there, they see this big, huge canal. They've got bridges connected to the mainland. They've got uh, the bridge sections that can be raised up for canoes to get through, pulled up for defensive purposes. It's so impressive, they can't even describe it because they've never seen anything like it in their lives. Okay, Now, both the uh, Mayans and the Aztecs, uh, an important crop for them, as I mentioned earlier, is the concept of growing maize, Okay, what we might call corn. We look at this, we might say, hey, that's Indian corn, Mr. Pulley. 
Well, Indian corn is very different from the varieties we grow today as either field corn or sweet corn. This is extraordinarily high in nutrition, um, a high protein content, as I mentioned earlier. We bred a lot of that stuff out, and now only grains like quinoa, which is native to South America, still have that kind of uh, protein content. Okay, off to finish up our last pre-Columbian civilization, this one being the Incas, the Incan Empire. Uh, going to look at it, um, it's in South America, running from parts of southern Colombia down through Peru into uh, parts of Bolivia and Chile, uh, and even over the Andes a little bit into Argentina. Okay, that's the last big empire uh, that the Spaniards will take over. Okay. Their famous two big cities are Cusco, which was their capital when the Spanish uh, conquistadors arrived, and Machu Picchu, which had been a capital, most famous because it was been found um, basically intact. It wasn't taken over, it wasn't destroyed, uh, but it was basically abandoned by the Incas as a capital city prior to the arrival of the Spaniards. It wasn't rediscovered by Westerners until 1911 when Hiram Bigham finds it. Okay. The Incans are uh, most notable for their roads, this big, long network, literally stretching thousands of miles uh, down the backbone of uh, South America. Uh, it requires roads for communications, requires roads for travel, for trade, uh, and this network of roads was highly developed. Some of them still exist today. Some of them uh, along flat uh, valley roads and some of these uh, on the, the, literally the edges of mountains. Okay, roads very important for them to travel, for communicate, for defensive purposes. That idea is the same kind of idea that the Romans will use later in their roads, which later influences a later uh, European leader, which then influences a future American president. And I'll make that connection for you guys a little bit later on. Now, the time of the end for a lot of those uh, great pre-Columbian um, civilizations comes with the arrival of the Spanish, the conquistador, these guys here. Well, not really those guys. Those guys are just reenactors. But they represent uh, a time period when the Spanish came into Latin America and took over and wiped out most of the civilizations they ran into. People often ask, how does a small group of guys, even if they kind of resemble or fit the description of gods in their um, religious tales, or even with the fact they have superior weapons, how does a few hundred guys defeat literally armies of tens of thousands of people? Well, part of the thing is, if you've been an empire that's taken over all your neighbors and you're controlling them very harshly, and not only that, you're sacrificing them, human sacrifices to your gods, when these guys come in and try to defeat you, a lot of them join on their sides. Oh, and they had one more secret weapon, disease. Smallpox that the Europeans brought with them. Native Americans had no defense against this. They'd never been exposed to it. And literally when they get this, death rates to smallpox in some places in Latin America, including the Americas where we are, 90 to 95%. Stop and think about that, 90 to 95%. We talk about the great plagues, the bubonic plague in Europe, death rates around one third, okay? They took the wealth that they found in Latin America, took that back to Spain, uh, became one of the wealthiest, most powerful, one of the first superpowers in the world. Um, but unfortunately, they've suffered from what I call rock star disease. And that is the fact that they have all this money coming in and they spend it faster than they can actually bring it in. And then people are very jealous of that in other European countries and they start trying to get in and steal that money and pretty soon Spain goes from being the top of the heap very quickly to the backwards people in Europe for a while. Okay. Now, when they come over and mix in, there's a problem. We have more men coming over than women. And so we're gonna try to settle and colonize this area. We end up with, a, as a result of this colonization, an interbreeding between Europeans and the natives and a person of European mixed European and uh, native or Indian blood is a mestizo okay so understand that Spanish society is very hierarchical in terms of nobility and, and people uh, down through various levels of society and in the Americas the colonies it's exactly the same way and we have peninsulares the folks who are of pure European Spanish descent but born in Europe we have insulares who are of pure European or Spanish descent, but born in the colonies, they're actually seen as lower. 
Okay, below that, then you have mix of mestizos. You mix a European with uh, an African slave, and you end up with a mulatto. We have various, various, various layers of mestizos uh, and, and society based on race in colonial Spain. Okay, and so their empire becomes huge and vast. Okay all the way from the northern part of our border uh, with Canada, all through Mexico, Central America, all the way to the tip of South America. The only exception, that's Brazil, that belongs to the Portuguese. We'll talk about that a bit later. Okay, last thing we're gonna talk about is this idea of deforestation, okay? It's a current issue in Latin America today. This colony goes on, and after the gold comes out, well, we've got to find some new way to kind of make money off these colonies. That's what colonies are all about, making money for the home country, okay? We look at the forest down there in the Amazon and think, oh my goodness, look at all this plant life. This must be some great soil, and it is as long as the plant life is there because it's the plants, uh, leaves and things falling off the plants, decaying with the insects and the bacteria and the hot, humid conditions that it creates that helps that break down and constantly re-enriches the soil, okay? And the trees offer, offer a break from the rainstorms that come down there, those torrential rains in the uh, rainforest in the Amazon, and they help protect things. Well, people come along and decide, I'm gonna burn this off and turn this into farmland, but there's problems with that. For a while, it might look beautiful farmland like this, but the problem comes along with the fact that without the trees there to re-enrich the soil, it quickly gets sort of burnt out. And we run into something called leaching. Now those big heavy rains come down and they're eroding the soil, they're leaching the nutrients out of the soil because there's no trees to uh, slow down its descent and scatter the raindrops. There's no trees dropping leaves to re nourish the soil. And so we end up with a very terrible situation. Okay, if you don't believe me, just ask these guys. Okay, that's it. A quick look at chapter 20, the geography and early history of Latin America. Part of a four chapter unit we'll be doing on Latin America. So stay tuned for more videos later. Thanks.